researching the servants at Chatsworth in the 18th century means I visit Chatsworth quite often and I often drive past the estate village of Enza. Enza is a chocolate box little village. It's got a beautiful church and a lovely cafe. However, this story isn't set in this version of Enza. The year is 1739 and the Enza you see today hasn't yet been built. Instead, this Enza can be seen from the windows of Chatsworth House itself. And the only thing separating it from the house is the River Derwent. If he was at home, it would be William Cavendish, the third Duke of Devonshire, looking out of his window, surveying one of the many estate villages that he owns. But instead of being at Chatsworth, he's in London. And although it's only March, it's already been a busy year. He's sitting in the House of Lords, overseeing the final building work on his new London home, and he's a founding governor of the Foundling Hospital. And it's about to get a whole lot busier, when on the 22nd of March, his agent at Chatsworth, and one of his most trusted servants, writes to the Duke. He's written from Derby, straight after the trial of James Lowton, the undergardener at Chatsworth, who's just been found guilty of murdering his illegitimate child in the River Derwent. The jury heard that Francis Coulson, whose family also worked at Chatsworth, had travelled from the village of Enza to Liverpool to give birth. From here, she wrote a letter to James asking to meet with him. He agreed, and on a November evening, the little family met on the Enza Bridge, the bridge which connects the village of Enza to Chatsworth House. Asking to hold his son for the first time, James experienced none of the feelings of joy or happiness that you might expect. Instead, he was more concerned with his own reputation and about keeping his job at Chatsworth. Fearing for her own life, Frances ran away, and the following morning, a little body was pulled from the river, and James was arrested and held prisoner at the village inn. Writing to the Duke, the agent said it would be more accurate to say that James had been butchered by the court rather than convicted. The judge refused to listen to any of James's evidence or any of the witnesses called in his favour. Instead, he chose to believe the evidence of a jailer who said that upon closing the door on James, he'd heard him pray to God to forgive him of his great sins. This was despite two other jailers refusing to say they'd heard the same thing. The trial was declared unfair by many and the agent wrote to tell the Duke that everyone was expecting him to step in and help save James from his death sentence. This was because even at a time when the relationship between land agent and his tenants was meant to be changing, the image of the Duke as champion and supporter of his people was still incredibly powerful. Over the next week and a half, the Duke received many petitions from several different people, all asking him to step in and save James. However, these letters start to tell a different story. Some argued that Frances had never sent a letter to James in the first place, and therefore the rest of her evidence must be a lie. Some argued that Frances had completely changed her evidence since she'd been first arrested, and one even suggested that the coroner in charge of the case was not properly qualified, and therefore the trial should be void. However, all the letters agreed that the evidence of the jailer was not to be trusted. In the words of one letter, he was a loose, lying, vile young man, and it was rumoured that he'd promised to marry Francis after the trial was over. A week later, the story changes again. Gossip was spreading through Enza and as far away as Derby, this time begun by James's own sister. She said that what really happened that day was that Francis and James were passing the child between them when the child accidentally slipped and fell into the river. Now, this story seems almost unbelievable and by this stage, you're probably just as confused as the Duke was after receiving all of these letters. In fact, this was clearly a story too far for the Duke, who was now beginning to doubt if James was even innocent at all. And this was the last letter he ever received on the matter. In May, two months after the trial began, James received a visit from a clergyman who delivered him his last rites. A month later, three lines in the London Evening Post revealed James's fate. Sentenced to death by hanging in chains, James's sentence was pushed back 
five times. By the end of July, five months after he was first arrested, James returned back to the village of Enza and to his job at Chatsworth House, fully pardoned. I can't tell you what the Duke thought about this, as none of his letters survive. I can't tell you if the Duke listened to the petitions sent to him and stepped in to help save James, or if anyone petitioned him in favour of Francis the mother. But whilst we may not know if James was innocent or guilty, what I can tell you is that these letters reveal just how connected this little community was. It was the miller on his way to work who found the body. James was arrested and held prisoner at the village inn. Residents of this village queued up to give James a good character at his trial. And it would eventually be the gossip of this village that made the Duke think again. And all this took place in the shadow of Chatsworth House. But it wasn't just confined to this small village. The trial itself was held in Derby. Gossip and rumours spread throughout Derbyshire, and you could even read about it in the London newspapers. So, next time you visit Chatsworth and you go past the village of Enza with its gabled cottages and its manicured gardens and homemade jam, just remember that whilst it may be small, and in the middle of the countryside, it has a story to tell and it's connected to so much more than you think. <laughs>